In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Ave Maria Grazia, plena Domina Stecum, benedicta tu in Maria Rebus, et benedictus fructus ventus tu Iesus. Amen. 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 Today we celebrate the second class feast in the Benedictine calendar of St. Rose Philippine uh, Duchenne. Now she was born in the year 1769 uh, in Grenoble, France, uh, to very uh, noble and wealthy parents. Uh, her uncle was, um, was actually uh, was in industry and helped finance Napoleon Bonaparte. Actually, it's kind of not the best distinction, but that, that shows a level of, of um, involvement she was in. Uh, one of her cousins ended up being prime minister of France. Uh, she was sent to at the time, it was an exclusive girls' school uh, for wealthier uh, parents uh, run by the Sisters of the Visitation. And uh, while there, as a young girl, she showed signs of having a religious vocation. She told her parents that she was thinking of becoming a nun. Uh, apparently, her parents were less excited about this than she was because they took her out of the school at that point. And then they, they schooled her elsewhere so that she would forget about these, um, these ideas of, of joining a convent. Uh, well, when she was 19 years old uh, in 1788, she um, decided to, to make a visit to uh, the Sisters of the Visitation, and she took with her only her aunt. And when she went to the convent, she uh, asked to be accepted right then and there, and they accepted. And so her aunt went back without her to inform her parents of what had happened. They didn't actually know that was, that was taking place. So... Um, I guess on the one side, you got to do what you got to do, but on the other side, um, maybe there's a better way to do things. Uh, because four years later, uh, because of the French Revolution, she was forced to leave the convent and return to her parents' home. Basically, she'd run away from home, and now here she was four years later. Uh, but they took her in. I mean, the whole country was in revolution at that point. And, uh, you know, we just, we just don't realize how horrible that would be, right, to have your convent disbanded by the government. That's exactly what happened. This, this uh, nuns of the visitation, they'd been established, you know, some hundred years earlier uh, by Francis de Sales and Jane Francis de Chantal. Uh, so this, this convent had been here for over a hundred years, and now here it was. Uh, um, all the nuns were told to basically go away, go home, do something productive with your lives, as if they weren't already the most productive things. But she lived in this uh, mansion as well as she could. Um, her parents lived there. Her, um, her uncle and her aunt lived there as a, a large, large manor. Uh, so she tried to live as best she could her religious vows with two other, other relatives who also had been nuns. And so they lived as best they could. They, they served the poor. They, ser uh, they cared for the wounded and the misplaced. Uh, and she had to do this for um, nine years. Nine years she lived in exile from any convent whatsoever. <laughs> until finally the, the uh, bloody and bloodthirsty French Revolution had finished. And so she, uh, she returns to that, that convent of the Visitation uh, and found that it had been used as a prison and as a barracks. And it was in complete disrepair, falling apart. Uh, so because of her family's um, influence and wealth, she was able to uh, buy back the convent that had belonged to them in the first place. It had been stolen from it, and that now she had to buy it back. But she bought it back, and she um, tried to resurrect uh, the, the uh, community that had been there. The old mother prioress came back. Some of the other nuns had returned. And they'd been living there their entire lives. Their whole lives they lived in this convent. And now they come back, and it's ruined. It's destroyed. It's falling apart. And many of these nuns are, are in their old age, and, and they, they just can't take the hardships, the cold, uh, the lack of amenities. And we're, I mean, we're talking, you know, uh, 1800s. It's not like the amenities are electricity and running water, right? It's even worse than that. Uh, so these older nuns just can't, are not able to, to do it. And so the community is uh, faltering after, after just three years of trying to recover from, from, uh, from warfare, from revolution, from murders, uh, from, from this theft. And uh, so it was in 1804 uh, that um, God intervened and brought to Rose Philippine Duchenne uh, uh, Madeline Sophie uh, Barat who had founded the order, the Society of the Sacred Heart. This is a new order of nuns. And so uh, she, um, Madeline Sophie, went to visit Rose Philippine 
and brought with her some younger nuns and, and wanted to make that a, um, a branch of her order, of the, the, the Society of the Sacred Heart. And so Rose Philippine um, eagerly accepts this. She realizes that this is, this is God's intervention, and she turns that, that failing um, uh, convent uh, of older nuns into a, a reviving community of younger nuns who are able to withstand the, the, those hardships. And, and between the two, Rose Philippine Duchenne and Madeleine Sophie, uh, they became um, uh, great friends for the rest of their lives. Uh, so now Rose Philippine, uh, formerly a nun of the Visitation, now is a nun of the Sacred Heart, and formerly cloistered, and now she is um, uh, dedicated to educating young girls. And so she founds a school there, and then again about um, 10 years later, uh, Rose Philippine relocates to Paris. And she becomes a novice mistress for the Society of the Sacred Heart and opens a school there also. And she's now 46 years old. And so she does this in Paris for uh, several years where they are visited from an American bishop, or rather I should say a bishop from America. This is the, that bishop uh, who was born in French, um, not French Guadeloupe, but uh, Saint Dominic in the Caribbean. And he was a French bishop of, uh, in the Louisiana territory and was visiting Paris and he asked for help from uh, the sisters for schools, for educating the children of the, of the French who were out there and also of the Indians who needed conversion. And so Rose Philippine had always uh, actually desired um, uh, to, to do missionary work. And so she asks and receives permission uh, to go to America. So she sets out a few years later and arrives in New Orleans in, what year was that? That would have been um, 1818. Is she's in New Orleans, and so she's 49 years old at this point, uh, nearly 50, and completely, I think about that, she's 50 years old, and her life has already changed dramatically like three or four times already. She joins a convent, it gets destroyed, she lives in home for 10 years, uh, then she goes back to the convent, tries to resurrect it for, for uh, five years, that fails, she joins an entirely new order, uh, and does that for 10 years, and then now she's going to America. It's, it's, it's completely, um, every single, it seems like every 10 years, her life is dramatically changing. She's continually giving herself to God. So here she is in America, 50 years old, and she doesn't, she's not very good at English. Uh, she never really learned to speak the language that well, um, but she does her best. She arrives in New Orleans in 1818 and takes a steamboat up the Mississippi River to St. Louis, Missouri, and eventually settles in St. Charles. Uh, that's a little uh, suburb north of St. Louis. And she builds the, um, or what is built is the Duquette Mansion, which is a log house. And it was, it was the first house of the Society of the Sacred Heart outside of France, the first in, in America, and the first, uh, they founded the first free school west of the Mississippi. She would write there of, of her experiences in, in Louisiana, the Louisiana Territory, that poverty and hardship were the riches of the priests in this land. And she and her sisters shared in those riches uh, uh, quite extensively. Uh, there were very difficult uh, conditions. Uh, the, the conditions were extreme, extreme cold, extreme hunger at times, poverty. And, um, but after 10 years, <clears throat> 10 years of this uh, difficult effort, she builds uh, uh, six more houses and several schools. And so in 1841, uh, there is a mission in Kansas uh, going further and further west, expanding outwards. Uh, St. Rose Philippine de Chen is now 72 years old, and she requests to go on this mission to Kansas. And she was not selected at first to go because of her advanced age and because her English was so bad, she actually couldn't teach anybody. Like, they, they couldn't understand her. Uh, but this is when the superior said, no, she needs to come, because if nothing else, uh, God will smile upon our efforts uh, because she's here present with us. And so she goes out there at 72 years old, and this is where the children uh, gave her the nickname. Uh, the Indian children called her Kwakana Umad, which means she who prays always. Uh, so uh, uh, they, they definitely saw right, that spirit inside of her. And um, so she's there for maybe a few years, but it becomes apparent. Uh, she's really just too old, too frail to endure the hardships there. Uh, so they send her back to St. Charles and she lives the last 10 years of her life uh, under the stairs. They, they, they wall off underneath the stairwell. That is her cell, and she lives there for 10 years uh, between there and the chapel. That's what she does for the last 10 years of her life. And so in uh, November 18th, uh, today in 1852, she finally uh, passed the next life at 83 years old. 
they buried her initially, uh, and then three years later they, they um, exhumed her to, to actually relocate her elsewhere and found her body incorrupt. And so she was uh, beatified, uh, ven first declared venerable, then beatified, and finally canonized by Pope uh, St. John Paul II in 1988. Uh, so, so, you know, what, what a legacy. Um, every, every, every saint's life is, is really unlike any other saint's life. Right, whether interiorly or exteriorly, no, no two saints are the same. Just like right, they say, no, no snowflake is the same, and no star is the same. Right, and that the just shall, shall run to and fro like sparks among the reeds, and they'll shine like the stars in the firmament of heaven. How many times was her life going to change, drastically, over and over and over again? You would think, okay, I've been through a war, I survived the French Revolution, my family, my friends, I hear of murders going on in Paris in the streets. Whole sections, whole sections of country getting getting killed, like the Vendée. She lived through that, and ten years of, of terror. You would think that after that, okay, God, now you're going to give me peace. I, I've punched my card. Right? I've done my time. I've lived through the horror of a lifetime. That it's it's over with. What follows for the next ten years? The Napoleonic Wars. As I, I mentioned earlier about that, that bishop, that, that uh, French bishop that came and asked her to come to America, he himself had to free, flee France because of the French Revolution. He fled to Spain. Then he had to flee Spain because Napoleon declared war on Spain. Uh, and so 20 years, 20, first 10 years of a revolution and then 10 years of a war, and then her life still wasn't over. I mean, imagine becoming switching from Benedictine to Carmelite or, or whatever it may be. You just switch orders entirely. That's a drastic change. And yet God asked that of her. And then at 50 years old, go learn English, which is not an easy language to learn. Uh, I mean, foreigners say that. They actually have a hard time with English because it's full of French, Latin, German, Anglo-Saxon, and a little bit of Dutch. It's not an easy foreign language. And the older you are, the harder it is to learn that language. And yet she tried. Then you go up, I mean, go up into St. Louis, Missouri in 1800, right? 1818. Uh, again, I mean, life was difficult even on the East Coast. And then here in the middle of frontier country, Indians, cowboys, right? Extreme heat and cold and weather and all that. 50 years old, doesn't know the language, right? And God is still asking her, give more and more and more because she, could, she was willing to give it, right? She could take it and she responded. She didn't feel sorry for herself, didn't excuse herself, didn't say, I've done my time, I've worked hard enough, my work is over with, now it's time for me to relax. I'm an old woman, I'm 72. She keeps going. And she goes out to that Indian mission even further, even further. Uh, so, you know, what, what courage, right? What, what, what a spirit, what an, an, an indomitable spirit she had, and she used it for the service of God. And so the, we, it's, it's the lives of the saints, right? It, it, it's women like uh, Rose Philippine Duchenne that make us realize how little we do and how little we've given. And that, and that we think we've given as much as we can. I just can't give any more. God is asking too much. Oh, no, 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 no. You look back at the life of Rose Philippine Duchenne. Right? That if I haven't given at least that much, it's not, it's not enough, not near enough. And, and we have come nowhere close, nowhere close in this country. We don't even know what hardship means for us. Right? We, we, we've had an easy life. Now, finally, with, with all the, this, this disruption going on in the world and rumor, wars and rumors of wars we're hearing, now it might finally be our chance to sum through something, a 25% of what Rose uh, Philippine Duchenne went through. And not to mention her and all those other nuns who got scattered out of their convent. Opportunities ours. Uh, so let's pray uh, to St. Rose Philippine de Chen that we might have some part of her courage, some part of her spirit, uh, some part of her work ethic uh, that enabled her to give her life completely to God no matter what, no matter what disaster, what uncertainty, what fear, what the future might bring. She faced it with courage. Uh, let's ask her uh, to pray for us to give us that courage as well. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.